The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's elected member webinar. Um, my name is David Farr, and I lead on the elected member development program at the Improvement Service, and I will be your host for today. Um, so, thank you very much for for joining us. Um, I can see that we've got um, elected members from a number of different councils that are joining us, from like some Aberdeenshire and Angus, Renfrewshire, Aberdeen City. Um, uh, Fife as well, and a few others, so it's, uh, it's fantastic you can join us from all over the country. And today's webinar is on the topic of community participation, um, and I'm joined by Dave Allen from the Scottish Community Development Centre. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, delighted to be with you this morning for the webinar. Just a few things uh, I'd like to cover over the, the course of the session today, looking at uh, community participation. Um, hopefully, by the end of, of the session, uh, we'll be able to have a, an increased understanding of the policy context and the key drivers for community participation at the current time. Uh, I'm also going to be looking at the, the national standards for community engagement uh, and going through them in a little bit of, of detail and talk about some examples from them as well. So hopefully, you will gain an understanding of the, the standards by the end of the session. Um, also, an opportunity to consider and explore barriers, challenges, benefits, and the impact of good participation practice, uh, and to consider and explore some key issues and ideas around the whole area of evaluation, scrutiny, and learning about community engagement as well. Uh, so, quite a lot to cover probably within the session, uh, but hopefully um, useful for you to consider those those things. Um, before we start, though, I think um, we'd like to get your ideas and your kind of views about uh, what your experience of community participation has been um, to date, whether that's from a, a professional point of view or your role as an elected member, uh, or from a personal point of view, of having been the, on the receiving end of community engagement or, or community participation activity. Um, so we've got a bit of a poll to start off with, um, and David will take you through that in, in a bit more detail. But um, I want to know what your experience of community participation has been to date whether that's been extremely positive, and you see it as having great value and positive impact for council services. Um, fairly good, you know, generally feel that it produces positive results. Uh, more mixed, where you've had, maybe had some good experiences, but also some negative ones. Um, poor, where you generally feel that there's little impact and, and maybe plays only to the loudest voices. Or very poor, where you've had no positive experience at all. Thanks very much for that, Dave. So you'll just be shortly seeing the poll launch on your on your screen. Um, so the the different options are are up on the screen. So I'm just going to give you thirty seconds or so to to answer that, um, and then we'll we'll see what kind of responses that we're we're getting from you. Um, so I'll go ahead and give you thirty seconds or so to answer it. We have 11% um, of you said that you have very positive, extremely positive um, experiences. 33% um, said fairly good. 44% of you were mixed, and 11% poor. So I don't know what you were saying about that, Dave, in terms of your, your experience of, of mm -hmm. community participation and how yeah. sort of reflective that is generally. I think that probably is fairly reflective generally. Very reassuring that nobody said very poor, um, uh, which, which is good. But I think generally kind of mixed up to uh, on the good side uh, is is pretty positive actually, and I think that's 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 fairly reassuring as well and a good starting point for the session. Okay, um, I'm just going to start with a bit of a kind of background, uh, history, and context for uh, community participation. Um, and have a look at some of the key themes that are emerging uh, at the current at the current time, and they give give you an opportunity to to ask some questions after that as well. Um, in terms of brief history and context, the slide um, shows um, kind of two two columns of of, of progress that so how community engagement has developed in Scotland over the past fifteen years or so, uh, and the policy context that has kind of run parallel to that. 
Um, I want to start off actually with the policy context on the right hand side uh, and go back to 2009 when the original Community Empowerment Action Plan for Scotland was produced. Um, I should say that community engagement had been around for a long time before that, but in terms of policy, um, so the first time that it clearly articulated um, what community empowerment might look like in Scotland. Uh, a key driver for, for change in the policy, policy terms came along in 2012 with the Christie Commission report on public service reform, certainly taking us to a new place in public service delivery uh, with a much more, I suppose, neutral approach to, to the, the design and delivery of public services. Uh, the next main, I think, milestone in policy terms was the Community Empowerment Scotland Act, uh, which was um, made law in 2015, uh, with a real focus on um, areas such as improved community involvement and community planning, um, community participation through participation requests, uh, and greater degrees of community ownership and control through extension of community right to buy and community asset transfer. Those were some of the kind of key elements of the, of the Act, and since then there have obviously been great steps being taken in implementing the Act. Um, from 2016 onwards, there have been other you know, quite significant developments. I think the development of participatory budgeting in Scotland has been um, quite a major development in looking at how, how communities participate uh, in informing uh, decision making and also budget budgetary spending and obviously that's continuing to develop and, and grow as we as we move forward to a uh, one percent uh, from local authorities under PB. Uh, the development of the Democracy Matters conversation about local governance is, is key as well. Uh, and areas like the new planning bill coming through uh, will have great, great kind of um, coverage of community participation and how local communities can influence and be all involved in local planning processes. Um, so there's a general direction of travel there, I think, um, and that's been mirrored by work on community engagement in Scotland. SEDC were involved in back in 2005 and, and you know prior to that in a two-year process of developing the original national standards for community engagement. Um, after that we were also develop, involved in developing voice and the online system for planning, implementing and reviewing community engagement and I'll say a little bit more about that later on. Um, since then there's been a steady increase in the number of voice users, but also we've had a policy environment which is increasingly supportive to community engagement, as I've kind of accounted in the, in the early part of this section. Um, in 2015, SEDC were also commissioned along with What Works Scotland uh, to review and refresh the national standards for community engagement. Uh, and that was a process that took place over uh, about 18 months. Uh, and since then, we've been involved in supporting organisations to use the national standards uh, and put them into practice. So that's some of the kind of brief history and context for community engagement and community empowerment uh, in Scotland. Key themes um, that have been running through that, um, I think public service reform has been a significant um, theme and a significant shift in how we do things in the public sector. Uh, focus on doing with people and not to them, uh, and I think you know public service reforms kind of under, underpinned a lot of the other uh, policy development in, in Scotland and practice development. I think we're now developing much more of a dialogue approach to engagement, um, moving away from a focus on top-down consultation, and I think uh, this is still bedding in, but people are beginning to get more used to um, actually trying to establish dialogue and more equal relationships rather than uh, actually consulting people on, on you know, preset ideas or proposals. Um, and a you know, kind of key element of that would be the approach to participation requests under the Community Empowerment Act, which are very much is set up as a means of dialogue rather than a means of complaint um, by communities about public services. Um, I also move to rights and responsibilities. Well, I mean, I think the Community Empowerment Act 
has extended a greater range of rights to communities, but also builds a greater level of responsibility of communities in taking over assets and delivering services. So that kind of balances up the whole area of extending rights with the idea of, well, that implies an extension of responsibilities uh, within communities, which also implies the need in, in many cases for greater support for those communities to take advantage of um, those increased opportunities, whether it's under the Community Impairment Act, whether it's through participatory budgeting or whatever. Um, a bit of a changing of the democratic landscape as well, with a greater focus on participatory democracy working alongside representative democracy and seeing kind of the development through participatory budgeting, but also the discussions under the local governance review, democracy matters process, just now about where governance uh, is best applied and what kind of levels of decision making should be appropriate at different at different kind of levels of of locality or or wider as well. Uh, so those are I think some of the key themes which we've been picking up on as an organisation that supports uh, community participation practice and community engagement practice. Um, and those are kind of just a bit of a background in setting the scene and I'd welcome any kind of questions on on that. Um, for the next five minutes or so. Yeah, thanks very much for that, Dave. Um, so, a couple of questions at the moment to, to put to you. If you've got any, if any like, members listening in have got any questions, please do um, please do ask them. As I said, we don't get to them um, during the Q&A. We will give you a response after after the webinar. Um, the first question we had in from, from a member was, is, is there a definition of community planning um, that you can you can give us? Oh, right. Okay. No, sorry, community plan. So, a definition of community participation. A community participation. Yeah. Um, I think we we tend to work more on the kind of definition of community engagement. I suppose it has been a a process um, where public bodies and others work alongside and with communities to um, develop um, positive solutions and positive responses to the kind of the issues. Uh, and areas of concern that are identified within communities. Uh, and so that definition of community engagement it can, comes up through the, uh, the national standards for community engagement, for example. Uh, so we would say that that um, implies that, you know, if you're doing good community engagement, you know, then you're driving up levels of participation. Uh, by those involved in their in their communities, uh, so all kinds of things underpin that, from kind of levels of involvement, inclusion, um, representation, accountability within that and within community structures as well. Thanks very much. Uh, just another question here is in terms of the key themes. What about public health reform? Yeah, something I didn't mention in the, in the kind of list of. Um, you know, policy areas or kind of policy developments which are which are important in this context. There's a process of public health reform going forward at the moment, creation of a new public health body for Scotland. Um, there's real interest from from public health and from from the NHS in um, what you know in driving up community participation and community involvement in the design delivery of, of, of health services. Um, I, I believe that our moves be made now towards developing um, standards for community participation in, in, in health service and design and, and delivery. Uh, and there's also keen interest from the uh, public health reform process in how we support greater community involvement, engagement in their own health, if you like, and taking taking responsibility for their own health and becoming involved in influencing service provision around health as well. Another question here is around about, um, is a key theme not also decreasing budget for public services? So I suppose, you know, how, how, are, we, how are we to do this at a time when um, there's, there's less money and less resource to go around? Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, it is a key theme and it's a key challenge um, because I think doing anything yeah, in terms of reform and against the background of reducing budget or reducing resource is always going to be more challenging than when you're trying to do that in times when, when there is more resource around. Um, but I'd actually 
I suppose helps to develop a dialogue um, amongst you know communities and other stakeholders about how best to make use of the limited resource available. And I think there's a kind of a reality growing within communities and community sector um, that actually you know things aren't going to be like they, they used to be uh, and there's going to be a much more of a need for that kind of I suppose that shared uh, approach to community development and community community engagement with much more I suppose being taken on by communities but the importance therein of supporting those communities to take them on effectively uh, and efficiently and not um, uh, kind of on, on the cheap if you like and um, so I think there's a real still a real challenge about that um, but I think much more of an awareness from community sector that um, that's the reality of things just now we need to if we want to improve outcomes for communities we need to do that much more on a shared basis. Thanks Dave. There's a few questions coming in around about um, where community participation falls down, the, sort of the lack of, of volunteers and the, and the same old faces and how do we stop the, the loud minority taking over rather than reflecting the community. But I think actually we might want to tackle some of those in the next part, um, if that's okay, because yeah. I think we'll, we'll start to come on to talk about um, um, some of the things that can that can help with that. Um, so uh, there's a couple of questions here. We, we will get to them in the in the next part, um, and and we'll, we'll give you an answer there. But for the moment, I'm going to hand back over to Dave to take us through the, the next section. Okay, thanks, Dave. Um, okay, I want to move on um, now to look at. Um, I suppose the question about what does good community participation look like, and, and what are the benefits, uh, and hopefully maybe cover up some some of those things that were coming in the questions there as well as we're going through that. Um, I want to talk about the national standards for community engagement. Um, as I said earlier, we were involved in developing the original national standards, uh, and also involved in reviewing and revising them a couple of years ago. Um, what are they? They are basically their set of good practice principles that are designed to support and inform a process of community engagement. But more than that, um, they're designed to be more than broad, broad principles. They're actually designed to give some more detailed performance statements, which are aimed at achieving kind of high quality results and, and the greatest impact. And by that, I, I mean that as well as having kind of broad, broad statements of what the standards are, they're underpinned by a set of statements of, indi of indicators of what good practice would look like um, in various settings and in various ways. Um, within the standards as well, if you have, have read them, there are examples of of good practice to illustrate each of the each of the standards, and I'll go through um, standards in a little bit more detail shortly, uh, and also mention a couple of examples as well to illustrate that. Um, what are they for? I mean, I think we, we when we were doing the review process, it was really important um, that we, you know, we had a dialogue with people, and we had a dialogue with a, a wide range of people when we were when we were developing the standards and reviewing them uh, about what they could be used for. Um, and people were saying that they wanted more influential community participation in public services. And that's every, everything from design, planning, delivery, scrutiny, through into policy, strategy and planning processes at one level. So that was one level about achieving more, more, more influence for communities in, in that, uh, but also to improve community engagement practice, not just in the public sector, uh, but across voluntary and community sectors as well. I think in the review of the standards, it was notable that um, we shifted things or people wanted that to shift quite substantially um, because the original standards have, had much more of a focus that it was just about how the public sector engaged with communities uh, in the devised standards. Uh, there was a real kind of feeling coming through from, from people we engaged with that they wanted improved practice, certainly in the public sector, but also in the voluntary sector and community sector, because they were recognising that maybe some community practice isn't great uh, in terms of the way community groups and organisations engage uh, with their wider community. Uh, and the other kind of key purpose was to support 
really good community-based or community-led social and economic development. And I think that comes into the, the field of, well, public sector is not going to be able to do all of this any, anymore. So we need to set you know, standards of engagement that support community organisations and community sector uh, to actually to do that and to do that well and to engage with people well. I'm going to run through the standards now. I'm not in a huge amount of detail. I'm just going to bring up the, the overall diagram from standards, which shows that there are seven uh, national standards for community engagement. Um, and I'll, I'll just give you a quick explanation of, of what they what they cover and what they involve, uh, and why we we've, we've constructed them in, in the way that we have. Uh, as you'll see from the diagram, there are six of the standards that are going round the outside, and a, a seventh one in the middle. Um, the the six going round the outside are cover key aspects of how we would expect public authorities and others to work with. Uh, and in communities um, with a focus on inclusion, on identifying and involving the people who need to be involved or who are affected by the engagement, uh, about providing proper support for people to be involved and to, to participate. I'll maybe come back to that later on in terms of um, usual suspects, discussions and, and you know getting new people involved as well. Um, about planning, about people being involved from the outset, from the early stage in community engagement processes, rather than just being brought in at a later stage. It's about working together effectively, and this is, I suppose, core to the whole idea of dialogue and where we're going in relation to working with communities rather than doing to them. Um, it's about using methods that are fit for purpose, uh, and that are appropriate for the kind of engagement that we're doing and the kind of groups that we're working with. Um, it's about communicating clearly, regularly, um, and with the people and organisations that are affected by the engagement. And all that with a view to achieving significant impact uh, for communities, to improve outcomes in and with communities as well. And that's why impact is in the middle. And people said to us very clearly in the review process, if it's not about achieving positive outcomes for our communities or positive impact for our communities, then what's the point of having a nice process? So it's fundamentally uh, essential and central to any community engagement process that is designed to achieve positive outcomes uh, for communities. A couple of practice examples just to, to, to give you an idea of what these might look like in practice. Um, these are contained within the standards as well, so you can read them at your leisure. Um, early, an early kind of participatory budgeting process in, in, in Highland, initiated by Highland Council, uh, but actually developed a, a very collaborative approach to, um, to that, bringing people together from local community and the steering group, um, and recognising and acknowledging different views and starting points. Didn't hinder, hinder the work, but actually helped to clarify um, what people's purposes were for the engagement uh, and for the PB process. Um, they ensured that the steering group rep represented a good cross-section of interests um, and actually helped steering group members to kind of develop that kind of sense of responsibility um, through the process and not just demanding of, of the process as well, going back to the, I suppose, the rights and responsibilities, I think that I was talking about earlier on. Um, and also about the ability of those members to reach out wider and involve new members into the process and to use their contacts to bring new people in as well, uh, which made a very positive and successful successful process and evaluated really, really well. Um, I would say that that experience in, in a PB process has been reflected and replicated in many other areas that we're aware of. Uh, with PB and PB can be quite a good way of involving new people, uh, and not maybe the uh, the folk that have been involved from from you know the last twenty thirty years perhaps. Um, so that's maybe an opportunity to uh, to look at that kind of wider involvement and wider engagement of people. And um, the second example I want to talk about is a community led one. Um, uh, we said and I said within the standards, much more of a focus on. Um, 
how community organisations and community sector can do engagement better, as well as public sector. Um, the example we have in the standards is Fraser Borough Community Development Trust. Uh, it's a locally governed organisation. Um, they were doing a community ex engagement exercise in, in Fraser Borough North. A bit of a needs assessment and an issue assessment in that part of the town. Um, as an area of high deprivation, there's a high concentration of migrant workers in the area, uh, and the, the, the group organisation recognised that uh, and made great efforts to support people to, to be part of that process. They worked with uh, training volunteers, uh, bilingual research volunteers, to do direct survey work. Um, and they've got much greater response to, to their survey and profiling activity and gave much clearer idea of the needs of all residents in that part of, of Fraser Borough rather than just kind of a limited limited amount of people. Those are just a kind of couple of examples to think about how the standards can be applied uh, in practice. And I should say as well that, that those groups and organisations didn't sit down with the national standards at the start of the process uh, and said this is how we'll apply them. This is just what they did. And they looked at looked at that process and said, well, this is actually reflecting of how these standards look like in, in, in practice as well. So that's a couple of examples, and I'm happy to pick up and, and through the questions of any more examples that people may want to to mention or or, or ask about. Um, some um, on the back of that, some benefits and challenges, and I think this is things that we've identified through our work in developing the standards and supporting people to use them. Um, that there are great benefits to public bodies and others of using good community engagement approaches and, and driving up community participation, better and more responsive services because they're actually you know, hearing what people are looking for in their communities and, and what they need, um, better outcomes for communities. Um, by not just by better services, but by greater involvement of those communities in, in being part of the solution as well as identifying the problems. Um, greater quality of life and satisfaction with with, with community life. Uh, and also the opportunity to re-energise local democratic processes and structures as well. So uh, if people have found new ways to get involved or uh, have been involved in something which is really positive and, and provided a positive outcome, they're much more likely to want to actually continue to be involved in influencing local de democratic processes and become involved in, in some of the structures. Probably has, has really good implications, or strong Im implications for local governance review. There are challenges though, and I think we've already kind of a couple of questions have mentioned them. Um, a reluctance in some cases by public bodies to cede power, and I think it's a real challenge for, for everybody involved in, in kind of local government and in other pu public body structures. Um, sometimes the structures get in the way of that rather than the, rather than the people involved in, in them as well. So um, the opportunity for people to have dialogue about um, what what how the structures work and how people can be involved in them, I think can be positive, but it's still a challenge. Um, there is an possibility that there will be increased inequalities in participation if we don't get the support and the inclusion uh, and the involvement right. Um, sometimes, and as probably referenced by a couple of the questions that have come up earlier, um, the opportunities provided, for example, through Community Empowerment Act um, could provide greater opportunities for those who have already got higher capacity to take advantage of of those opportunities. So we really need to pay attention to um, where are the least heard voices, um, who are maybe dominating discussions at, you know, and kind of views at the moment, and how do we actually begin to drive up the, the participation of those who are furthest away from that at the moment. So there's a, there's a bit of a danger and a challenge there. Um, other challenges already been mentioned, a couple of questions about financial pressures. Mm -hmm and austerity measures, um, big challenges, and we need to be able to have dialogue with communities about how best to address them and, and, and can respond to them. And also a real challenge about kind of working relationships that are historical 
affected by historical differences, lack of trust, or whatever. So I mean, we're willing to acknowledge them and be able to kind of actually almost kind of, you know, recognise that those exist, um, and we need to do something better, better to improve relationships between communities and public bodies. Thanks very much, yes, Steve. Um, we've got a few questions, and I think we want to go back to a couple of questions that we had before. Um, there's a question in asking about the uh, the national standards, and um, just looking for an example of in what way are local authorities applying the standards? Okay, yeah, I think it's um, it's varied across across the board. So we're aware that in some local authorities. Uh, and some parts of local authorities are using the national standards and using things like voice, um, and you know, very, very effectively and very thoroughly um, to underpin their their community engagement and community participation practice. And seeing that as in a real positive way of actually being able to make sure that they're delivering good quality uh, community engagement as well. Kind of just. Um, aware of one or two authorities have looked at that in relation to uh, their involvement in locality planning uh, or supporting community involvement uh, in locality planning. Um, others looking at using the standards to provide a baseline for self-assessment of their community engagement and community participation in council services uh, as well. So there, there, there are quite a few examples across the board. I think Probably um, less examples of where whole councils are using using the standards, but maybe certain sections, such as community learning and development or community empowerment engagement services, are maybe using the standards more than than other sections of the of the council. So it's not across the board. Um, it's a bit more mixed, but it's I think it's coming through. You know, fairly significantly in certain areas where people are seeing, yeah, these an opportunity for us to improve practice and to establish better relationships with our communities. Thanks, Dave. It's, so back to a couple of questions that were coming through earlier around about, you know, how, how do you, you know, control the loud minority taking over rather mm. than reflecting the community? Mm. How do you um, engage people beyond the, the the same faces that are always there? Um, from what I'm picking up from you, it's it's for us to start to pay attention to how we're involving our communities in the in the work. Is, is that fair? Yeah, I think it is, but it's also I think it's a bit of a challenge. It's a positive challenge to some of the more established community organisations as well, um, to actually say to them, look at the standards, look at how you're how you're operating, and how do you involve people in your in your wider work. I, I, we've what we've uh, we've done some work recently with community councils in in exploring with them. What they feel the way forward are for for community councils are, for example, um, and they're really good examples of practice with community councils, and there's less good examples as well. Um, but I think there's a willingness from most people involved in community organisations that kind of those those kind of structures, at least to have that discussion and to to see well how how are we involving people on a wider basis. We've had discussions. Um, with, with folk involved in community councils at local level, we say yeah, we'd really love younger people to be involved in in what we do, uh, but it's not attractive for a young person to go along to a community council meeting on a cold Tuesday night in December or something like that. I almost said August there. Um, so uh, actually, they're conscious of the need to need to do things a bit differently about giving, you know give people different opportunities to be involved. Um, Actually, to make it a bit more fun as well, and I think that's some of the the stuff we've seen around about uh, community-led participatory budgeting processes have actually um, involved a wider range of people than might traditionally have been involved in that in that kind of stuff, um, which has been good. A lot more kind of processes led by um, groups and organisations that we never never have contemplated being involved in, in that kind of activity before, uh, including a lot of a lot more youth led PB processes as well, I have to say. Um, we're also using kind of much more engaging and, and 
fun method so of getting people involved and actually and for people to see a real impact of what they what they do in terms of funding for you know key projects or key initiatives within within their community there's a question here around about how do um, how to assess the level of of decision making and a uh, participation and involvement um, in community participation work. Um, so, is there, a, is there a target percentage response rate for you know the, the population that we should be aiming for, or you know how how do we how do we assess that? Yeah. This might come up in the, in the, the, the next bit of the session, looking at evaluating and scrutinising community engagement. I think it's always difficult to put a kind of figure on on that as well, because we, sometimes the figures don't tell us much more than just a number of people that, that turned up at something, or whether they actually had any influence or any real participation uh, in, in the process is, is much more kind of um, debatable, I suppose, and, and much maybe much more difficult to prove. Um, I think, you know, I think again we'll kind of cover this in, in the next bit, but and the kind of real uh, opportunity for us to actually scrutinise the quality of of community engagement, whether people feel they've had their voice heard, uh, whether you know provision has been made for people to participate and take part in, in things and influencing and being involved in in the local communities or what, whatever is around at the moment. But also whether people want to do that, have the opportunity to do that as well. We need to look much more closely at um, what opportunities do people have to be involved, whether it's online and um, whether it's face to face, you know, whatever. We need to be much more clear I suppose about what methods we use to engage with people and that way we'll begin to get a much clearer indication of greater levels of involvement, greater levels of influence from a wider range of people as well. So I don't think we would ever put a percentage in a kind of number. I know in, in pure research terms if you're doing if you're doing community based research or something like that, people say ten percent return of population on, on surveys or questionnaires and that's fine. But there are different levels of involvement, there are different levels of participation, um, which, you know, kind of sort of counterbalance that, I suppose, as well. So the, the possibility of kind of light touch engagement, asking people what to think about something, which you might want to attract a greater number of responses, but then you might want to do much more deliberative, intensive engagement with people, which would necessitate a much smaller number of people to be involved in that process because it's not viable. And to do anything any other way. I think it kind of plays out in the PB um, processes as well, where there's, you know, it ranges from very wide kind of public voting processes um, to deliberative processes and defining, you know, priorities and options for people to vote on uh, as well. So there are various kind of stages in that process where you can have more or less people involved at greater or level, greater or less degrees of intensity. Okay, thanks very much, Dave. Um, do you want to take us to the next section then? Yeah, sure. Okay, um, it kind of fits fits quite neatly, I think, with, with, with the next bit. I think I mentioned before that, you know, this is kind of whole policy background, particularly Community Empowerment Act, has been a, a big, you know, sort of driver for community participation engagement work in Scotland. Um, work of Audit Scotland that they've been doing over the past couple of years, um, uh, along with other scrutiny body, bodies is, has been quite important. SCDC have been involved in a, an advisory group on this. Um, and the, 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 the kind of view from Audit Scotland was they needed to have a much clearer idea of how they could inspect or scrutinise um, community empowerment uh, within public bodies uh, across the board, and not just themselves, but other scrutiny bodies and inspection bodies uh, in Scotland. Um, and they've been looking over the last couple of years about, well, what does good community empowerment practice look like and what does good community engagement look like? Um, they're working through now a, a draft um, document that's been, been discussed at the moment. Um, so I'm not sure how public this, this is, but I'm not, I just want to talk through some of the key principles that they're, they're, they're describing in that draft document at the moment. Um, things like enabling communities to take more control over decisions and assets. Um, 
ensuring strong and clear leadership on community empowerment that sets the tone and culture of an organisation, uh, about building effective working relationships between public bodies, local communities and local partners, evaluating whether outcomes for local communities are improving and inequalities are being reduced and about being accountable and transparent. And those are and those are the developing principles that they're, that they're putting into, into this process or are coming out of this process. Probably people will be able to see fairly clearly from that quite a connection to what we're seeing in the national standards, um, particularly about, I think, the effect of working relationships, um, looking at the impact of, of community empowerment and community engagement practice uh, and the whole area of accountability and transparency as well. Um, so that's work in progress and I think they're hoping to um, produce quite a robust but accessible framework fairly soon which will inform, uh, it's designed to inform uh, future inspections and scrutiny processes across a range of scrutiny agencies um, and more will be coming out about that soon. And I think it's useful to have that as kind of in the background about well this is the, these are the kind of things that inspection and scrutiny bodies are going to be looking for um, if they're not already doing that in, in their inspections. Uh, and it's a bit of a driver I think for, for public authorities, local authorities particularly, uh, to be able to look at well how are we do, how are we doing this already, what kind of evidence are we are we producing for that as well. Um, I suppose a kind of bit of a help for this is the voice tool that we've uh, that we've developed. Um, I'm not going to go through this in a huge amount of detail, but I just wanted to give you a bit of an idea of uh, um, how this tool could be used to to I suppose support building evidence, producing evidence for good, robust community engagement and participation. Um, voice has been developed by ourselves to support the implementation of the national standards for community engagement uh, is basically a, a four-stage process for people to, to plan, record and evaluate and review how well they do their community engagement. So it's set up on, a, as you'll see from the site map there, set up in a four-stage process about analysing um, you know, what the situation is, who, why they want to engage, what they want to know and who they want to involve in a process planning that out, what they want to achieve from the process, actually doing it where they record what they're doing, what doing it when they're doing it, and producing the evidence for that, and then a review stage where they actually say, uh, explore how they've met the national standards, but also have they met the outcomes, the, the, the stated outcomes from the process as well. Uh, and, and Voice was set up to provide an opportunity for people to do that better collaboratively um, because, and it's established online to do that uh, but also to help people produce evidence um, which will help them to demonstrate how they're meeting the national standards and also how hopefully you know producing evidence that can um, satisfy scrutiny bodies and inspection bodies as well. Um, Voice isn't just for public bodies, voice is used by community organisations and third sector organisations as well, um, who have found it very useful in providing, helping them to provide evidence for things like funding applications um, and so on, because an increasing requirement from some of the big funding bodies, particularly like the big lottery, um, for communities to evidence how they've engaged and consulted and involved their wider community in developing their project proposals. Um, so to produce that kind of evidence of community engagement is really, really useful uh, and voice is a tool to be really useful um, uh, to support that as well. Um, so it's one of the one of the ways, one of the tools we think that can help support public authorities and others um, to plan it out, um, do it, record it, and review it um, on a cyclical basis as well. It's not just a linear process. It's designed as something that people can revisit and learn from um, as they go through and then into the next stages or other community engagement processes as well. One of the key parts of voice at the end of, of the review section is what have we learned uh, for us that's one of the most significant questions in the whole in the whole tool um, we're just at the stage now of, of being kind of redeveloping voice a little bit we won't be losing the 
the core structure, but we've got the opportunity to update it a little bit for the current context uh, because it's been in existence since 2009, I think, or 10. <laughs> I'm trying to, struggling to remember then, but we've got, you know, we've got over two and a half thousand users on the system just now. It's free to access um, and it's user controlled as well. So it's very, uh, it's very kind of user friendly as well. If I can use it, anybody can. Um, so that's just a little bit of a kind of um, hint for, for some of the kind of methods and tools and some of the kind of questions I think that scrutiny bodies are going to be asking over the over the next wee while, particularly in relation to the Community Impairment Act and its implementation. Thanks very much, Dave. Um, so this is your, your final opportunity to ask any questions, uh, so please do um, type them in. We'll try and get to as many as we possibly can. Uh, the first question we've got here is, um, Members looking for what ways are elected members currently scrutinising community participation work? Are there any examples you could give? I think, I, mean, I suppose the examples that I'm aware of haven't been so much about elected members scrutinising and community participation work, but actually being involved very directly with communities and, and local partnership groups in using some of these tools like voice or the standards uh, and informing how they're working collaboratively uh, on, on local issues. Just gonna, a couple of examples on that, working um, to support um, community involvement in locality planning in the local authority area um, and one of the local um, steering groups for that process. We've got two elected members actively involved in that, uh, one who's the, the, the chair of the community planning partnership. Um, and they're actively on one where the, the, the group are using voice to plan and record and evaluate the community engagement process that, that, that they're doing. And um, so the members are definitely involved in that and using that as well uh, and aware of that they're aware and supporting um, the staff uh, within community support um, team um, to use voice uh, as well. So there's an awareness uh, amongst the members of what, you know, what voice is for, what can be used for, uh, and then they're supporting sections of, of their of their staffing um, um, to to use that and to put that into practice as well. Uh, and I think that's been the case with one or two other areas where we, you know, like members have been involved in in training that I've delivered at local level um, for a variety of partners um, uh, on the national standards and and the use of voice as well. So there's been a keen interest. Uh, for members at local level about you know how they can use that to to inform the practice and to be able to actually use it as um use that as as a scrutiny tool uh, as well uh, kind of aware of as a, another council area um where the members have actively supported um key officers in the council uh, to develop a self assessment framework um using uh, the national standards, but also best value um, framework from from Audit Scotland, uh, to devise a self assessment framework for their community participation. If any further questions, please do type them in. Um, we've got around about seven eight minutes left, um, so uh, we'll use the time if there's if there's questions. Um, just to bring it back slightly to the last section, um, there, there was a question around about. Um, so, how do you engage communities where there's no internet access or there's rural deprived areas um, and for individuals who, who don't normally engage in public meetings? So uh, it comes back to some of the um, how, how we're engaging with mm -hmm. them, but you know some of the, the, the other methods and new methods maybe rely on internet access um, or, or whatnot. Mm -hmm. So yeah, anything that you can um, you can say to that member? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think voice obviously is online. Um, but we're conscious of the fact that um, people either maybe maybe not have good internet access or are reluctant to use it in, in that kind of community community setting as well. Um, so all voice materials um, are produced in hard copy format as well, and we have guidance available for for people using voice to be able to to help them to do that. Um, yeah, very conscious of the fact that you know, even in, in kind of um, 
more urban areas, the internet access in community halls is not always good or or, or in existence uh, at all. Uh, and many communities we want to be able to use these processes best are those that are, you know, less digitally included than than, than others. I think it's I think it's fair to say as well. Uh, so always conscious of that. Um, and we also recommend within the standards that and the methods used, are there are a variety of methods of used uh, to engage people in local communities, and they will be they will vary greatly across the country depending on what location is uh, and what local circumstances are, and also what the participating groups want and and prefer. We've got something within the method standard, and the standard which says you should be prepared to adjust your methods. Uh, based on the feedback from participants. So if participants say, well, this is no good for me because I can't get internet access or uh, I can't get out of the house in the evening or I've got, you know, you know caring um, requirements or something like that, you need to change the method of engagement um, uh, to suit that person or to suit that community. This is sort of a, it's a similar question, but almost the opposite then. Um, and I'm, I'm going to throw you a difficult question here, uh, Dave, because I'm not uh, sure you'll you'll know the answer to this one. Um, but there's a there's an online tool called um, Console. Mm -hmm. um, it was used in I know it's used in Spain, and there's a couple of local authorities looking at it at yeah. the moment. Um, have you any experience of of using that, or or how it's been used to support better engagement? I haven't got any direct experience of using it, but I'm aware of it because we have, you know, had discussions with um, Simon from Cosla, who's been um, looking at the development of that with, and and kind of testing it out in a couple of local authority areas as well. I mean, I think that kind of tool looks like it could be could be really useful for certainly for getting dialogue going, giving allowing the opportunity for people. On a very kind of on an individual basis, almost to kind of raise issues and concerns within the locality or areas for discussion, and then hopefully, if you like, stimulate action around that. I mean, to see whether there's the opportunity for collective collaborative action on on the kind of issues that are raised through through that kind of online discussion dialogue. Um, site. So I think it looks really quite exciting and quite interesting. Um, Conscious again that not everybody will be comfortable in participating like that, but I think it's a good additional um, opportunity for people to get involved in contributing to their ideas to local debates and local issues and discussions. And maybe people that wouldn't be comfortable going to a community council meeting or you know responding to a formal council consultation or something like that. So I think it it begins to make it a little bit more. Um, accessible for folk that might not be comfortable with more traditional forms of consultation and engagement. Uh, we've been having discussions with um, COSLA about potentially linking voice, the voice system into that console portal, because I understand that it is a portal, so uh, it'd be an opportunity for various different kind of platforms to, to link into that, to give opportunities for, for people to engage in different ways at different levels. Um, you know, through that through that system, but I don't have the technical level of knowledge how that will work. But I think I understand that that's possible. Yeah. And I think what's fantastic at the moment in in Scotland with um, with this work is that there's there's so many different local authorities and other public services and and, um, and community groups that are trying different things. And I think there's a lot of opportunity to to share knowledge and, and see what is what's working elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I know a couple of local authorities are looking at that too. And um, if it's working, then certainly others will get an opportunity to to, to see and, and hear about yeah. that. Um, just a, a final question. Um, a member has asked concern that um, sort of results may be easily misinterpreted without all the information mm -hmm. being available. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming this is the, um, the information that you're getting from um, from the community with any kind of participation and engagement activity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so how how can um, yeah? So if the results are misinterpreted and um, there's vested interests, um, how mm -hmm. can this be overcome? If this is a, a, this sounds like it's a participatory budgeting kind of query or question, I think um, 
we're conscious from SEDC's point of view, we're, we're, we're involved in supporting PB um, at the moment. Uh, but supporting good quality and robust participatory budgeting processes and part of that has involved us in developing a charter for participatory budgeting in Scotland. It basically, I think, is kind of in response to concerns from some areas that PB processes maybe haven't been all that transparent and uh, maybe not all that inclusive um, as well. So I, I think we are really keen to make sure that people know what good, inclusive, robust participatory budgeting looks like and that would include um, you know, people who've been very open and transparent about you know, how they've engaged people in the process, how they've promoted their PB processes, how people have been supported to be involved um, uh, and you know, having that level of transparency um, so that local communities can actually see um, how decisions have been made and who's, you know, Who's voted for 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 what and so on? We would make that home to kind of a basic minimum requirement for a PB process that those those kind of procedures and processes are in place from the start. Um, I think you know just kind of an, an addition to that is that um, from the areas that and the, the groups that I've been supporting um, to to run their PB processes locally, I've been really impressed about how rigorous and how robust local community organizations are uh, when they're when they're running their PB processes uh, and I, so that's been very heartening for me um, I think they're very conscious of the need to be transparent and open and accountable um, for how those PB processes are run um, and so I've been I've been really heartened about how they've communicated um, right throughout the process not just in the lead up to PB events but also afterwards about who's received funding and who hasn't and about supporting people who have been unsuccessful as well and developing those kind of networks and 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 referring them on to other possible funding sources as well so um so i'm fairly heartened about that conscious of the fact that doesn't apply right across the country but i think that's why we're doing things like developing the pb charter well, that's all we've got time for this morning. That's been a very, very quick hour. Um, so thank you to everyone who's who's joined us um, this morning. Um, I'd like to, to thank Dave for sharing his insight um, and his experience. Uh, so thanks very much for your time. Um, enjoy the rest of your day and have a great weekend. Thank you.